Mr. Eklund, of course, is the director of the uh, Water Cons Conservation Board of the state of Colorado. Thanks, Dr. Lorenz, appreciate it. Well, thank you, Doctor, and thanks to the uh, Arkansas River uh, Basin Water Forum. Um, so many of our great leaders come from this basin that it's, uh, if I started naming names, I'd be up here through the entire presentation. But uh, suffice it to say, we have John Stolp and uh, Jim Broderick and Jay Winter. And as I look around, I'm, I know uh, so many of you. And I really apologize if you're hearing this presentation for like the 15th time. So uh, half of you could probably do a better job giving it than I do. But I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I've been looking forward to this time on my calendar uh, ever since I got scheduled. Uh, can you guys hear me OK all over the place in the room? OK, great. Um, Really, uh, you know, everybody from water leaders, water managers, uh, NGO groups in this basin, uh, county commissioners who are here that recognize the importance of water, you just can't live in the Arkansas River Basin and not understand how important it is. Uh, so we, we uh, are excited to have this basin be heavily engaged in the conversation that I'm going to go over in, in detail here. Uh, and then, and then, you know, I've, I think I've got an entire 60 minutes here with you. So, I'm going to, I think, use some of that time to. It will be most productively used, uh, getting into a little Q and A with you. If you, if you guys have woken up from that first cup of coffee yet this morning. So, um, let's remind ourselves of our Colorado landscape here, real quick. So, if you, uh, if you uh, have. Uh, any interaction in the water world at all. This is no surprise to you, but every once in a while it's helpful for me to remind myself of this. But you basically have on the, you know, the western, plant, the western slope here and, and this continental divide that divides our state down the middle. Uh, then you have out here the front range and, and the eastern plains and where we find ourselves today. 87% uh, of the people live over on this side of that line. 80% of our water is on this side of the line. So fundamentally, right there, we have a water delivery issue in Colorado that we've been grappling at with since statehood, really. Um, as a result, we have 26 Trans Mountain Diver 24 Trans Mountain diversions that go from this side to this side, uh, the Fry Arc project being one of them. We have uh, really uh, water where we don't have people and people where we don't have water. Uh, and that has really given way to a, a creative, I'm going to say this diplomatically, a creative tension between the western slope and the eastern plains. Uh, and, and that goes all the way back, you know, really to the first Trans Mountain diversions that we saw in this state. Uh, so let's go over to Grand Mesa real quick here. These are my great, great grandparents. If you've seen me before, you're tired of seeing their stern faces. But I often say, you know, they, they homesteaded over there on the north side of Grand Mesa in, in, back in 1888. Uh, we all have our Colorado story, right? Uh, and I've heard many of your family stories about how your families ended up in this great state. Um, but uh, I often say when I give this talk that if you'd have told them we were working on a state water plan, this would have been their reaction. Uh, not, not impressed and certainly skeptical, right? And, and I understand that because 10 to 15 years ago, I would have been skeptical too. Uh, I would have said, we have a water plan, thanks. It's called the Doctrine of Prior Appropriation. That's all needs to be said on the matter. Uh, and as a good water lawyer trained in this craft, I, uh, I, I've been brought up to, to, to believe that, espouse that, and I still do uh, appreciate and, and uh, really uh, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this water plan is because of that underlying doctrine and this being the next step in the, in the, the next chapter in the doctrine of prior appropriation for the state of Colorado. So um, I would have said that's all it needs to be said on the matter, but that was before we saw some things, right? We saw um, really some challenges uh, that we hadn't seen on the scale that we're seeing here. Uh, we, we've seen a systemic drought around the state in the worst 14 year period of record uh, of drought in the Colorado River Basin ever measured. So I don't need to tell you all that we have uh, 
in our snowpack, something that unites us as Coloradans. When the color guard came in here, they brought in the United States flag, but right behind it was the Colorado flag. It wasn't the Yampa White Basin flag. It wasn't the Gunnison River Basin flag. It wasn't the Arkansas River Basin flag. It's the Colorado flag. We're united by these, this snowpack that really supplies water to both sides of the divide. Uh, that snowpack, if, if you don't really need to see the numbers on this, all you have to really get out of this is that yellow line's average. Most years, we're seeing years that fall below average in our snowpack on the Colorado River Basin. And every once in a while, we get a year like 2011, and hopefully like this one's shaping up to be, where we've got a, a year or two above that line. But as water managers will tell you, and many of the people in this room will, will uh, will agree that we have to plan for the, the years below that line, below yellow. And if we, if we plan for the big years and pretend like everything's fine, then we get ourselves into trouble. So one of the fundamental things that this plan is doing is, uh, is, is talking about drought and how we respond to it. One other thing we hadn't seen before was you know, reservoir elevations in Lake Powell. And John McClough, our Upper Colorado <coughs> River Commissioner, is here. Uh, and can talk in depth about this, but this basically, you know, this graph is meant to show you that if we continue to have bad years, bad water years in our snowpack on the Colorado River, then we have a challenge in Lake Mead that we have got to uh, do some planning uh, basin wide on, contingency planning that uh, we could talk more about if, if there's interest. Um, it's also before we saw a recession that struck Colorado and the rest of the country. Um, but we saw people not moving out of Colorado because of that recession. We saw people moving here. They wanted to live here. They wanted to grow their families and their businesses here. And we think that based on you know, that recession and the numbers we saw in growth coming out of it, we, we're probably going to see a continuation of people wanting to move to this state and people wanting to live here. So we're supposed to reach uh, you know, another 5 million people by 2060. Um, Right now we're at 5.5 million. We'll be at 10 million by 2060, if, if not sooner. And uh, in fact, analysis that was released a couple of days ago um, showed that we're the fifth in the nation in uh, labor force growth in, in Colorado. So we're a, we're a state that's in, in a pretty decent uh, territory with regard to our economic forecasts and our diversity of economy with the ag economy that we have that led us out of this recession uh, that you're, many of you are a part of. Uh, that, that makes Colorado a state that's going to be a desirable place to live. It was also, you know, before we learned about a gap between supply and demand that will be evident in almost all of our basins uh, within the next two decades. So let's head over to the front range here. Uh, we could afford, you know, we, to, to rest on our laurels, I guess, and uh, uh, that were established before the Basin Roundtable process in over 780 meetings. We're almost up to 800 meetings that, that have occurred in this Basin Roundtable process uh, since 2005. Um, that's the act. You're all familiar with it, 1177. If you're fortunate enough to be here yesterday, you heard about uh, the Basin Roundtables. You'll hear more about in depth about what they're doing and what they hope to accomplish uh, today on some panels. And so we're, we're really proud of this, uh, this, this uh, uh, trajectory that we're, we're on, that we have this structure uh, that was set out in this, in this act back in 2005 by some forward-thinking individuals uh, trying to broaden this conversation. And this is the first time we've had that. Uh, and now that we have a critical mass of information from those discussions, we think we're in a good place to, to do this work. So it was also before Front Range Water Providers. Um, sorry, let me go back to this. Well, I'm going to skip over that. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was before, you know, we had uh, uh, a state that, that uh, really agreed that we're, we've got some buy and dry problems. And, and that's where, you know, we have a water plan in the state of Colorado, right? We already have one. It's called buy and dry of irrigated agriculture. And if we want to continue down that road, then we don't have to do anything. We can, we can just let this all play out the way, you know, as, uh, as my boss Mike King has said in the past, uh, water Darwinism can take hold. And, and we can do that, but 
We're seeing statements like this from the Interbasin Compact Committee and the Basin Roundtables and elected officials around the state, urban and rural, that this status quo of permanent buy and dry is unacceptable and we need to do something different. So let's go back over here um, to the front range. That, you know, the front range water providers have been, um, I think, taking some pretty forward looking, um, making some forward looking moves. This is a, a map, you can't really see it very well, but it's the south metro, metro area in Denver. And if you're familiar with the metro area, you know that there's some uh, groundwater uh, reliance that needs to be diversified if that part of the, of the metro area is going to, to continue to grow and, and have some certainty. So the WISE project uh, that is being worked on as a cooperation between some of these, you know, the bigger trans mountain diverters in the, in the metro area uh, in cooperation with some of these uh, the South Metro area communities, you know that's the kind of thinking that stretches water, the Trans Mountain water that's coming over from the Western Slope, stretches that further. That water can be used as the water you know lingo goes to extinction. So we have to be very very uh, diligent and and efficient and wise with that water, no pun intended, I guess. Maybe there is a pun intended there, uh, with that water. And we're seeing some activity like that uh, on, in the front range. The other thing we're seeing is more agreement uh, of this kind. This is a bunch of people standing on the steps of, uh, of uh, Grand County uh, Courthouse, I believe. And they, uh, they got together and worked on the Colorado River Cooperative Agreement. If you're not real familiar with that agreement, uh, that is what we want to see more of in this state, and we have to see more of. And we have to see more people coming together, Denver Water in this instance, coming together with uh, over you know, uh, 20 to 30 uh, Western Slope entities, including the Colorado River District, uh, to make sure that they were all getting what they needed to get out of this deal. That's the kind of thing that we're going to see in the future. Gone are the days of people just taking water and, and there not being a conversation about it. So, you know, I can stand up here and say uh, that our water picture is fine or, you know, uh, tell you that it, our, our water picture is better than it is. And that's what a lot of my predecessors, people in my position like to do that because it's easy and it gets you out of the room with applause. But it's not the, uh, it's not the responsible thing to do. And I'm not going to do that here. But it's also irresponsible to say the sky is falling, right? Uh, we, we know that it's preferable to plan before a crisis. Uh, Sean Cronin, the round ta Basin Roundtable Chair uh, from the South Platte, who I think is uh, on the panel later on today, uh, articulated uh, this very well a couple of days ago at a different conference. He said, uh, uh, you know, they saw the flooding, right? The flooding that happened in the, in the South Platte this last year. And, uh, and he said, you know, there's a, there's a surefire way for interest to get overlooked or overridden, and that's when you plan in the midst of a crisis. Uh, and we've done that before in our, in our state. And, you know, his point was, you know, the environment doesn't get taken care of when you have blown out infrastructure, health and safety problems that are the result of an emergency. So if you want to do planning, you need to do it before the crisis hits. And as a state, statewide, that's something that we have to do. Um, on occasion, I guess, and I hear this, uh, this statement every once in a while from members of, I'm sorry to say, my own colleagues in the water bar, well, we don't need a plan. You know, we've, we've, we've got one. And, and again, if they go back to that old mantra, it's the doctrine of prior appropriation and we're good. And, and you know, I, I'm the son of a basketball coach and um, so you're going to see a lot of basketball analogies laced throughout the talks that I give, or if you get me in the corner and have a conversation, I pull out John Wooden quotes and things like that. Uh, but the, the reality is that we uh, in Colorado have uh, a game that we're playing, right? And when our, 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 our water court system, our water law is set up to, uh, our, our water lawyers are paid, we pay them, you pay me, uh, to, to go do work not to lose. That's how we work. Don't injure me. That's, that's the mantra. Uh, but we don't play to win. And there are people that we are dealing with on an interstate basis that are playing to win.
California is in a drought, then they're playing to win. You guys in this basin have seen Kansas play to win. We have to be postured and as a state, as one state, moving together with one set of vision and goals uh, to play to win. Because the, the just, just don't hurt me attitude is not going to advance our water policy and our water financing and the water conversation in Colorado the way it needs to. So back to these guys, if they were still around, I would, uh, well, actually, before I get to them, uh, this is a map that the state of New Mexico produced when they were doing their water planning, and it's a little outdated. There should be uh, blue shading in Washington and Oregon. All the blue shaded states have water plans. Arizona's working on a visioning statement right now. We're not on the leading edge of this, and these are a bunch of prior appropriation doctrine states. They didn't eviscerate their doctrine just because they did a water plan. They're actually doing this stuff because they know that to protect that system of private property rights, they need to do planning to show all the people in their state and to demonstrate that that doctrine works and is flexible and can maneuver and adjust. So that's something that we're having to do here in Colorado, and we, uh, we really are in these negotiations with other states on the nine interstate compacts. So we've got nine interstate compacts, two equitable apportionment decrees, and we have 18 downstream states that rely on water that originates here. So everybody's watching us. The federal government's watching us. The states downstream on these compacts are watching us. NGOs that have national interests in scope are watching us very, very closely. If we twitch, they notice. So we've got, um, We've really got a, a, our work cut out for us in making sure that we have a plan that articulates where Colorado is going so that it is not articulated for us or to us. Um, so back over here, I'd say, you know, if these guys were still around, I'd say, cheer up a little. Uh, you know, the, the doctrine of prior appropriation is still alive and well over a century later. Uh, just a quick show of hands. I know I'm in the Arkansas and water is important, but how many people know what the doctrine of prior appropriation is? Excellent. That's, better, that's a better show of hands than I get where I'm from up in Denver. So uh, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the educated audience here. Uh, you know, we see that the beauty of this doctrine that you all raised your hands on just, just now is in its ability to adjust. It's, it was forged as a pragmatic response to the riparian doctrine from the East Coast that, that really said that, you know, uh, water is tied to the land in a way that you've got to have a use of front uh, property interest to use any water. And that's not, that didn't work in the West. It doesn't work in Colorado. And so this doctrine's been here since before statehood, and yet it's, pro it's proven resilient at every turn. And there have been a lot of turns for the doctrine of prior appropriation. Um, the growth of our ag economy, right? The, the growth of our cities, both front range and western slope. The, the energy booms and busts that we've seen as a state, the connection between surface water and groundwater that was recognized in our 1969 Act, uh, the advent of, of environmental and recreational flows in the late 60s, early 70s, and then the drive for more efficient water use in the face of uh, reduced or compromised hydrology. That's something we're dealing with right now. That's our challenge today. Um, so just as I told them to cheer up a little, then I'd say, get serious again, because the doctrine of prior appropriation is under attack. Uh, we, uh, we've seen a, uh, repeated uh, attempts to, to do away with it. We'll see more in the future. And uh, contrary to those arguments that you hear on that, this isn't some dead, stale doctrine that, uh, that we've outgrown somehow. This is a, a doctrine that allows our water policy to continue to advance in a way that protects water users of all types. Colorado's water plan must, can, and will, no pun intended, uh, work within the doctrine of prior appropriation. Not over it, uh, but uh, within it, and not over the top of it, you know, uh, but, but uh, for it. So our system of, uh, of ditch and reservoir companies, many of which have a strong history here in this valley, uh, rest on that doctrine. So let's agree as Coloradans uh, and as a water community that the best defense of the doctrine is a good offense. With your continued help, Colorado's water plan can at the very least provide some of that offense. We, uh, 
continually need to show all of Colorado that this doctrine works and it's capable of meeting the challenges we face. And those challenges are many. We have seen over the last several years drought, wildfire, and flood. Uh, and in fact, in the last year, we saw those all in about a six month period. And several of those people, and I look right at Mike Gibson when I say this from the Rio Grande, you know, the, no basin is safe from this, including the headwaters of the Arkansas, including the headwaters of the South Platte. Our western slope communities uh, have been dealing with watershed health for a long time and will continue to do so. We have got to get serious about how we manage holistically our watersheds, and this water plan, we're hoping, is a vehicle to do that. Um, so again, back to the flag here. The doctrine of prior appropriation is called the Colorado Doctrine uh, because it's a doctrine of collaboration and action. It encourages neighbors to get together and work out their problems and find solutions together. Uh, what the doctrine does not do is counsel us to curl up in the fetal position and hope all those challenges, the drought, wildfire, flood, that those just go away somehow, that they, they fix themselves. Um, the, the bottom line is this. We're not going to luck into the Colorado that we want, that we, are, we want for our kids, we want for our grandkids. We have to be intentional about it. Other states have seen this. They've recognized that they're doing what they have to do on their, uh, in their borders to get that done. And this mission is clear. We have got to be doing this in Colorado. Um, where we think that you know, the process that you all have heard about and many, many of you are participating in in these basin roundtables um, is exactly the, uh, the, the prescription for this, this illness that we have. It's, it's a structure that allows this plan to come from not Denver. If this radiates out from Denver, I'm fond of saying it's dead. It's dead on arrival. What it has to do is come up from the grassroots up. And that structure that we have established and, and that you all have been a part of in the Basin Roundtable process is, is a structure we're proud of. And other states, uh, and, and uh, you know, Kate McIntyre's here, she does some of our outreach. A lot of different states have been coming to us. Some of these guys have water plans, yes, but they, don't, they haven't updated them in eight years, 10 years. And, and they're looking at us and they're saying, wow, you guys, you guys didn't just, you know, cloister a bunch of water gurus in a, in a room somewhere in your capital and come out with this plan a couple of days later. You did this the hard way and, and really the right way, which is going out into the basins, having the discussion in the basin first, and then having it come up to, to the state level for, to inform the plan. Uh, so, you know, we're having other states ask us that. Kansas, you'll be happy to know, is asking us, hey, how did, how did you set those up? We're interested in that. Uh, so we, we're, uh, we're, I think, postured well to, to make sure that we're, we're planning well for the next, the next uh, uh, chapter in Colorado's water. Um, when you're doing this work, it, I can stand up here and talk till my mouth's dry about the, uh, the right way or the wrong way or what's going to be in the plan or what's not going to be in the plan. Um, really, it's informed by the grassroots, so I can't honestly tell you what we're gonna what we're gonna see as far as a, a draft plan come December of, of this year. What I can tell you is we have to uh, do this work. And you know, if you're in a ship and, and it's it's pre GPS uh, and and you've got to get from point A to point B and there's no markings on the horizon, you've got to have a pole star to navigate to. We have to have a pole star in this in this work, and that. Pole star is this uh, this set of goals and and uh, values that that have been set out not only in the governor's executive order back in May of last year, but these are really found in the genesis of these, as in the basin roundtable discussions and then the work of the IBCC. And they're what you would think of if you sat down at your kitchen table and had to start drafting, you know, the water values for the state of Colorado, uh, vibrant and sustainable cities robust recreation and tourism, healthier waters in the environment, viable and productive agriculture. These are the things that make Colorado, Colorado, right? So we have, the, they sound like a lot of platitudes, they sound like hyperbole, but in reality, they are critical. Uh, we've got to keep our, our, not only our, our goals and our, uh, our water dollars, uh, but also our policy aligned to reach these, uh, make these a reality. So how are we going to do that? 
you've got a bunch of acronyms up here in bubbles. Basin roundtables is BRTs. Uh, th this is all testing a fundamental premise, right? A philosophical premise. And that premise is that if you put people that are of different stripes, different occupations, different interests, different geographic areas together with the same facts, good facts, then you're going to get more agreement and consensus than you get <coughs> diversion and, dis and, and uh, disagreement. So we, uh, we have the statewide water supply initiative fo fondly referred to as SWAZI that we've been using as the common technical platform for all of this work. It's the reason we know more about this gap now than we've ever known. And we're continually updating this SWAZI document so that the da data is fresh and current and that it's informing a discussion by the Basin Roundtables and the IBCC to hopefully get to some points of consensus that will inform that water plan. So that's the whole premise, is you put people together that otherwise fight tooth and nail because they, they see the 30 second sound bite on TV that you know, boils their blood, and you put those people together with the same facts, and they're gonna see a neighbor across the table instead of an opponent. So that's, that's, the, you know, that's the fundamental thesis that we're testing here. So what will this plan do? What will it be? Well, like I said, it's gonna be informed from, by the Basin Roundtables, you know, bottom up. Um, and, and this process is, is gonna have to uh, take everything that we hear from those roundtables in their basin implementation plans. I'll talk just a little bit more about that later, but it's gonna have to address the gap. It's gonna have to protect, preserve, and enhance our rivers, formulate alternatives to buy and dry, align state water efforts and water dollars, and incentivize quicker regulatory processes. So this is a John Wooden quote. Uh, John Wooden said, uh, be quick, but don't hurry. So you see quicker there in, in uh, uh, quotes because the, 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 the uh, wizard of Westwood was saying that when you hurry, you know, don't hurry because when you hurry, you make mistakes, you have to redo work. But when you're quick, you're more efficient, you're more effective whether you're setting a pick, or you're rolling, or you're passing, or you're shooting. That's true of what we're doing here. We don't want to uh, skip, uh, we don't want to shortcut any of the uh, environmental safeguards that we have in our regulatory processes. That's why they're there. But we can do a better job than we're doing now. We can be more efficient than, we're, than we are now. Uh, the old adage is it used to take three years and $3 million to permit the average water project in Colorado. Now it takes 10 years and $10 million. And it's probably going north of that, right? Um, so we've got to be more agile as a state. I guess that's the bottom line. We've got to be more agile, and this plan hopefully gives us a path forward to being more agile. So how do we do that? In the regulatory world, this is, this is kind of the, the thought that's, that's being discussed around the state. If we provide regulatory incentives for projects that meet certain factors, so if you meet certain factors, right, then you have resource prioritization at the state level. So let me just give you a quick tutorial on regulatory, on the federal regulatory process, and on many of you in this room, uh, through projects that have gone on in this, in this basin, are familiar, more familiar with this, with this than I am. But nonetheless, we have two. Uh, areas where the federal government looks to us in the federal regulatory process for a water project. Clean Water Act compliance and wildlife mitigation. Uh, the feds have just said, that's up to you guys. You're going to have to go do that on, on, your, uh, on your dime. And uh, so we've done that. Uh, the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment does the Clean Water Act compliance. The Department of Natural Resources does the uh, wildlife mitigation work. And we turn, you know, that around to the federal government, usually at the end of the permitting process. So, and, and that is usually where a lot of the discussions with the stakeholders happens. So instead of that happening at the, at the front end of the permitting process, usually it's happening at the back end. And like I said, if it's taking decades to get to the final stages of a permitting process, we're not having this conversation until a decade or so after the permitting process papers have initially been filed. And that's not good, that's not efficient. We have to have that front loaded. And if we do that, the idea is, you know, we do a quick audit of a project, it meets the factors, the project proponent gets together with stakeholders and local government and says, yeah, this project needs to do X, Y, and Z. Project proponent says, sure, let's do it. 
they do the things that are right by Colorado, right by the community, then we can prioritize our resources to get that Clean Water Act compliance and that wildlife mitigation front loaded in the process. That would lead to the opportunity for a state endorsement of a project, and then the concept there is quicker regulatory process from the federal government moving forward. So happy to talk more about that later if, if anybody has any questions uh, about it. So this is our outreach mechanism. If you haven't been, how many people have been to a Basin Roundtable meeting? Again, much better than most places in the state, so that's excellent. Uh, whether you've been once since 2005 when these over, you know, almost 800 meetings have started being held, uh, or you go religiously, uh, let me say thank you for going. And if you haven't been, this is an excellent time. You do not have to be a water wonk uh, to, to get involved in this conversation. And it is the perfect time to get involved because you have a basin implementation plan process that is working its way through every single basin roundtable. And we have this, uh, our job and, and Kate McIntyre's job is to make sure that we have tools that are user friendly for you to go out and talk to your neighbors and, and talk to the other folks on you know, your ditch or, or the folks, you know, your fellow county commissioners, and have a conversation that doesn't have to be, uh, you know, preceded by a whole glossary of, of acronym education. This is supposed to be able to, you know, uh, be understood by lay, lay people, not water people, and if we've failed in that mission, you let us know because we'll fix it. Uh, we have a, a water plan website, everything from the Basin Roundtable meetings to uh, the materials that are over here with our display to, um, you know, uh, Twitter feeds uh, are on that website. In fact, you see some of those Twitter feeds down there. Uh, you can do that with social media. And I always get a chuckle from the water community about social media when I talk about it because everybody's like, well, I, we don't use that social media. And I, I say, well, you know, when the, when the flooding happened, and Sean Cronin can tell you, uh, in uh, the South Platte, you know, when communities were not sure which roads were closed or where public shelters were or things like of that nature uh, were located. They didn't, they didn't go to the Boulder County website. They went to Facebook. And Boulder County figured that out real quick. And the counties that were affected figured that out and went to Facebook themselves and started listing that stuff. So social media is a tool. You should be using it. We should be using it as a water community to get this message out so that we're having a larger conversation uh, with more people than just the water folks. So uh, water is as important as all the sexy, glamorous issues that usually take up your, your dinner table conversation time. And that's something that this plan, we're hoping, you know, that's a byproduct of this plan also. Uh, you know, whether you're talking about energy development and fracking or healthcare, education, transportation, water is every bit as deserving as people's time, of people's time and their energy and involvement. And this water plan conversation, you know, there's a home for them here. So this is our timeline. Um, you can't really read this very well. It's articulated in a small print at the bottom of the one sheet over uh, the, that's by our display. But basically, the governor gave us, a, us the Colorado Water Conservation Board, a uh, directive. Uh, and there, there are several, Diane Hoppe, John McClough, uh, several uh, members of the CWCB here today uh, that have, um, you know, when we got this directive, we were direct, it says specifically in the executive order that we are to harness and utilize this basin roundtable process. And that's what we're doing. So that executive order came out in May. It called for a draft state water plan by December 10th of this year. Um, the basin implementation plans are underway and we're going to be taking a snapshot of those basin implementation plans. They don't have to be, you know, wrapped up with a pretty little bow on them. They can continue to work, the basin roundtables can continue to work on those plans, uh, but we need to take a, a, a snapshot of where they are so that we can start the drafting process to get us to a draft, like I said, by December 10th of 2014. So this is, Re this recognizes the political calendar, and the governor was uh, adamant that it do that. John Stolp was adamant that it do that. Uh, that's after, you'll notice, the election. So whether it's a reelected governor, Hickenlooper, or some other governor, it's going to be on that person's desk 
and they will have a document to look at and then analyze and then either remand back to us for further work or order us to go out into the state and make sure everyone understands what's in it. Um, but we have some, we'll have basically an entire uh, year of 2015 to get the thing into fighting final shape so that we can, uh, we can immediately start work on the next update of the thing. So that's, uh, that's the challenge that we have. When you do all this work, you know, and you saw the map with all the states with the water plans, they really fall out along a couple different axes, axes here. We've got the glossy report sits on a shelf, doesn't do anything, uh, and then meaningful action on the other end of that spectrum, right? And then you've got property right owner control states like us, like Texas, like a lot of the prior appropriation states around the West. And then you've got centralized control states like California, where they just build water projects there. The state builds them, and there aren't a lot of private property rights. Um, we need to be hanging out in that quadrant right up there, because that's the state we're in. We respect the doctrine of prior appropriation, and again, whether you agree or disagree with some of the things I've said up here, I hope we can all agree that we as Coloradans want to be doing this work our way. And there's Alan Hamble back there. Uh, so uh, we've got some really good representation from the CWCB here today. And uh, we want to make sure that you guys have uh, an opportunity to ask any questions you have of me and then find them. Uh, I'll throw them right under the bus at, at breaks and things and, and, and ask them your questions. Uh, we're excited about this. This is a big deal. And, and you all can be inv involved in this. And thank you for those of you who have been involved in it. And with that, I'll, I'll shut up and take questions. Thank you. Uh, it's time now to uh, open it up for some questions. For, for Mr. Eklund. Your basin's never shy, so <laughs> don't start now. So the question was, uh, what are some measurable outcomes of the achievement of this plan? It's an excellent question. You have to have some rubric to measure yourself against to make sure that you know we're doing right by the, the state and this is, this is actually working, right? So uh, when the final comes out in 2015, you know that slide I had up there that articulated the things that we needed to be able to tick off, um, one of the things that we have to, you know, one, one rubric or one measurement is are we providing alternatives to permanent buy and dry that actually get at the problem? Uh, we, we have to do that. If, if, you know, that's, that's a pretty hard measurement. Um, or, I mean, it's a, it's a hard number measurement that we can, uh, we can look at before and after uh, numbers and, and see if, if we're, we're influencing the conversation or those transactions at all. And again, those are willing buyer, willing seller transactions, right? So, you know, no one's saying, and the water plan can't, won't say, doesn't want to say, that anybody that wants to sell their water right can or can't do that. They, they, they obviously can if they want to. There's nothing in the water plan that will say that they can't. So uh, we, that, that's one metric. Another one is, you know, this gap between supply and demand. That's a real gap. It's not, we, don't, we didn't make it up. Um, and as more people move to Colorado, we think more people are going to be moving. You know, the majority of that population growth is going to be in the Front Range, uh, both in this basin and the South Platte. And um, unless, you know, people are moving, we'll, we'll know if people start, if, the, if all that new growth moves to the Western Slope, <clears throat> I can tell you that the Western Slope's not going to be too happy about that. So we're going to have a, a, some kind of soft rubrics uh, to, to determine, you know, are we turning this ship? But it is kind of like turning a big, you know, ocean liner. It's not going to turn on a dime. And what we're talking about with this plan isn't something that's a silver bullet to any of the challenges that we raised here. But we're trying to influence the trajectory that we're on so that we're not headed to, you know, off of a cliff here. Um, and as I think more about that, I'll, I'll uh, you know, the regulatory process, if we can shorten regulatory permitting times, that's a, that's a rubric, that's a measurement. Um, 
if we can make sure that our water dollars, and we've got finite water dollars in the state, um, that we have aligned those so that we're, you know, they're not acting at cross purposes, that we're actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, incentivizing uh, behavior that is, in, is consistent with the values. You know, that, those are kind of, there's some hard numbers that we can look to uh, to make sure that we're doing this the right way. And then, of course, the basin roundtables don't just poof go away uh, after this draft comes out or the final comes out. You know, they, they can, uh, you know, the, the beauty of the Colorado Water Conservation Board is that each of its uh, appointed representatives are from the basins themselves. So they are a direct conduit to, uh, to the, the plan itself. And if there are people that are unhappy or don't feel like it's making measured progress, then they're going to hear about it from you and, and the Basin Roundtables as a whole. Did that answer the question okay? <coughs> Well, and, and you know, I guess I'll go down a little rabbit hole here on you, just real quick. Uh, what differentiates us from Texas? So Texas doesn't have a compact with the Gulf of Mexico. Gulf of Mexico doesn't care. Uh, I mean, environmentally it does, but it, it's, not, it's not calling water. There's not a call from the ocean. Uh, so when they get more efficient with their ag production in Texas, they can grow their irrigated acreage so that they hit the root zone on more acres and grow more crops. We can't do that in Colorado because two thirds of our water exits this state under those compacts and, and has to go to a downstream use. And in fact, is used multiple, multiple times, as is the case in this basin, by multiple water users um, as it makes its way down through the system and then past the state line. So, you know, uh, Texas can measure a lot easier. It's a lot easier for them to say, well, we got more efficient. We grew our irrigated acreage. Uh, here's the bushel uh, 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 expansion or growth that we got as a result, a direct result of these policies that we're putting in place. And we don't quite have the same luxury up here at doing that. So just, it's, a, it's, it's true. We, we've got to have a sustained, diverse economy and, and agriculture is a massive part of that. Uh, but it's not as easy to measure it as it is in states that are right next to the ocean where they don't have a, a compact with the, with the ocean. <coughs> right down here. Right over here. When that big flood came back in September in the South Platte River, did most of that water wind up in the Mississippi or did it get all caught in Kansas? Well, <laughs> most of it went to Nebraska and Kansas, uh, and, and uh, Sean Cronin can talk in gory detail about that uh, when he comes up here. But what, one of the things that uh, I've heard from him and others in the basin is, you know, you have off-channel reservoir storage that peop most people probably thought, oh, well, you've replenished all that. The flood filled all those buckets. What the reality was is you know, the, the infrastructure that pumped the water into those buckets was blown out by the flood. So you, you had all that taken downstream and all, those, all that infrastructure is now, you know, those, those diversion structures are sitting in Nebraska and Kansas now and they're not doing us any good putting water into the buckets that they were created to, to help uh, convey water to. So it, it, we did see a lot of water but we didn't get to store, we, we got to store very little of it, uh, I think, at, at the end of the day. Now, Denver Water and some other water providers, uh, certainly, you know, there were situations where certain reservoirs filled uh, uh, much quicker than they would have otherwise. But it, it wasn't the, uh, the silver bullet we were hoping, you know, the silver lining would have been, yeah, a lot of devastation, a lot of tragedy, but we got some water uh, relief from it, and we didn't see quite as much of, of that. Okay. What kind of negative feedback are you receiving on this plan, and is there consistency? Well, yeah, so the question was, do, do we f receive negative feedback on the plan? 
And I'll say, uh, and, and is there any consistency to that negative feedback? And I would say it's of the kind I described where, you know, there's this mantra that um, we don't need a water plan, and, and the state talking about water can only mean bad things for, my, for, for us. And that's, that's something we as a state just have got to get over. We've got to get past it, and this is the process to do that because it's really coming from, this isn't, Again, this isn't radiating out from Denver. It is a plan that uses a structure that is from the grassroots up. Um, so I would say we, we hear some negative comments every once in a while, but once they hear what it's not, uh, that it's not taking private property rights, it's not saying you can't sell your water right any, you know, any, uh, in any way that you can do now. Uh, what, it, what it is trying to do is give you more options. So my parents uh, run a cow-calf operation on the north side of Grand Mesa there. And it's a stark choice for an ag operator. You either, you know, sell your water right and kind of treat it like your 401k and move off the property and the land, you know, the water leaves the land. Uh, or you kind of hold on and maybe your kids come back and, and farm or you find a, 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 a young farmer to come in and, and take over the operation. Um, but that's a pretty stark set of choices. If we can provide more, uh, more options in that, w when that decision point is reached by an ag producer, for them to take advantage of or not, or they can choose not to. They can choose to do what they can do now, which is just sell the water if they want, or hold on to it or whatever they want to do. But we as a state need to be providing more options so that people don't feel that hemmed in by that stark, that stark choice, if that makes sense. And any, any negative thoughts you all have, I mean, any of you, my door is always open. We have a, uh, you know, I'll have a stack of business cards. You can call me anytime. Uh, you can call, obviously, you're, you're, you've got your Basin Roundtable rep, uh, reps here. You've got uh, the CWCB rep and, and Director Hamill here. Uh, so we're, we're, uh, we're all ears if you have concerns, questions, or if you're hearing negative comments out there, about what this is or what it isn't. We have a frequently asked questions part of our website that is designed to try and help people uh, understand you know, both what the plan is, but also what it isn't. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any oh. alternatives or incentives outlined at this moment? So, uh, for ag, for alternative, so this basin has been really at the forefront of innovation and on the alternative transfer mechanism uh, front. And we at the state have been trying to encourage that with a, you know, a grant program. It's called an ATM, Alternative Transfer Mechanism Grant Program, that uh, some folks in this basin have taken advantage of. Um, we, there was a bill passed called uh, House Bill 1248 last, last session that set up uh, the opportunity for pilot projects to test uh, more innovation on, the, on that front. And we had some of the best, you know, uh, per interest and participation coming from the Arkansas Basin and in Jay Winter and uh, you know several folks and it couldn't it didn't quite get off the ground but there was this concept of that Fowler was going to be the first pilot and it didn't it, it didn't quite launch uh, uh, on the timeline that we were talking about but you know you learn from everything we're going to learn from that process too and we 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 really uh, are thankful for the work that this basin's done on the alternative transfer mechanism front. But yeah, there is some stuff going on out there. There's uh, everything from water co-ops to water banking to to uh, you know ag fallowing with a conservation easement kind of tacked in there so that you have the water. You know you can you can kind of farm money for uh, the years when you didn't want to put seed in the ground, and then you can all. But you could also um, you know have the water tied in perpetuity to the land. So. You know that there's there are some alternatives out there that we're exploring and trying to package in a way where you don't need a phalanx of water lawyers. Sorry to my brethren and sisters that are out there in the water uh, bar, but you know package those in a way where you don't you don't have to move heaven and earth to get to take advantage of them. Chris, where where is this plan at with the legislature right now? I know there was some conflict earlier. So Chris uh, asked, uh, "What was the or wh where where do things sit with the legislature?" There was a bill, uh, Senate Bill 115, that was introduced, and as introduced, it it kind of talked about you know the legislature wanting to kind of take take this work on themselves and do the water plan as opposed to 
the agency and the Basin Roundtable is doing the work. And uh, to the to the legislators' credit, uh, the sponsors uh, amended that bill, and and uh, it it no longer does that. What it does is it gets them. It, it requires the interim water committee to go out and meet in the different basins around the state uh, while this water plan discussion is going on. So in, you know, once the legislature convenes here, or uh, adjourns in, uh, in, let's see, May 7th, it sounds like, then the interim water committee will, will be kind of riding the circuit along with us and, and hearing from people in the different basins about uh, what this, uh, this basin implementation plan work and this, this water plan work that's going on. So uh, the bill's ended up in a good place. We are appreciative of the work of the sponsors and the cooperation of the bill sponsors to get that done. Quick, start back here. Yeah. Yeah, Director Eckler, do, do you foresee after the state water plan So the question was, is after the water plan's done, do we see there being a nexus for a state water project of some kind uh, moving forward? And, uh, you know, it's a good question. I, it's certainly not in the conceptualization of the board and me or the governor or the, you know, the, the base roundtables that I've talked to that we would, you know, try and accomplish that. Uh, certainly not right out of the gate. We just want, it's, it's a bridge too far, and it's, there would have to be a lot of discussion about something like that before it would become a reality. But it is a concept that is, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll use Texas as an example. So Texas uh, started doing their water planning you know, back 50s and 60s, and, and they've gotten to a point now where everybody is in their state fairly comfortable with their their water plan and it's not the black helicopters coming to take their water so they they've uh, gotten to the point where they're they're okay with a listing of prioritized projects in their water plan and you know can our plan get there someday where we uh, you know like I said we've got finite water dollars and financing for these projects uh, if we have to prioritize them, we'd rather do that on a statewide basis, again, from the grassroots up, not, not out, you know, just somebody, some bureaucrat like me in Denver picking which projects go in what order. Uh, so maybe the plan gets there. Hopefully, we get comfortable as a state with, with where our discussion's headed, with the plan itself, and then with iterations of the plan as, it, as it's updated every so often. And, uh, and we can be more aggressive and agile and, and take th some things on. But it's not going to happen right out of the box. And, and uh, you know, down the line, it may have to happen because, you know, you, I've seen some of the modeling, and I'm sure some of you have too, of uh, the effects of the impacts of climate change on our snowpack. And if we fall off a cliff, like Australia did uh, a decade ago, and don't recover, don't see any years above the lime green line, uh, then we're going to have some really tough decisions to make, and I think this water plan will put us on a, a good f uh, footing to have those discussions. And you know, at that point, when it gets that bad, there may have to be you know some pretty dramatic steps taken. And so I wouldn't rule it out, but I can tell you it's not it's not the uh, concept to to try and tackle that right away. A question down yeah. here. Um, you mentioned that. Some of the reality we have to live with and the challenge includes the, the drought and, and wildfire and floods. How will the plan get at that issue of the watershed health, the general watershed health? So the question was about watershed health. How's the plan going to tackle that monster? And it's a big one. Uh, we're, we're not going to be able to solve all the problems at once, but one of the things that, you know, the board has talked about with me is, you know, uh, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the salinity issues on the Colorado River, but we have a geologic formation on the western slope that as the water cuts through those valleys, it picks up a lot of salt. And it takes those, those salts down into the lower basin, and the lower basin looks at the water and says, I can't put this on my crops. You're going to have to clean this up. And so we say, well, we'll clean it up. You're going to have to help pay for it. And so they do. They, they contribute, and the federal government contributes to uh, the salinity control program where we line canals and ditches and, 
and have uh, brine deep injected into, uh, you know, out of the way. And uh, there's there's this this program to try and get at something that affects more than just Colorado. And the same is true of watershed health. Uh, those 18 downstream states that depend on our watersheds also, you know, uh, should be at the table or uh, contributing to the solutions because their snowpack, every bit as much as ours, like I said, two thirds of our water leaves the state. Uh, the, they they have a vested interest in making sure that they help address watershed health right along with us. But we we need to do that more holistically. Usually, it's compartmentalized the conversation. You know, we've got. Uh, the State Forest Service and the U.S. Forest Service and the BLM and uh, all the different managing folks that have something to do with watershed health. Uh, but, you know, our hope is that this is this water plan is a way to grab them all, put them in the room and say, hey, we've got to figure this out. Uh, Travis Smith, uh, director from our Rio Grande on the CWCV, has made has just been adamant on this point. And he's adamant because he's got people like Mike Gibson chirping in his ear all the time and saying, hey, we, we've got an issue. When you burn, you know, when you have a wildfire that not, you know, that, that burns through mismanaged or unmanaged uh, 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 forest above a watershed, you've not only compromised, you know, the health of that forest, but you've, you've, you're talking about my reservoir and my delivery system now. And that brings the water community in. So we as a water community have to be engaged in that discussion, I think is the bottom line. And, and we're all ears. Gary Barber from the uh, Arkansas here is, is working on uh, 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 really attempting to try and bring more of the basins to a common understanding of what watershed health is. And all the front range uh, communities that have, you know, water providers that have high mountain uh, delivery systems or collection systems, they uh, their eyes are wide open on this right now, so we can't miss it. We have a question down here. Hi. Um, I'm very new to this uh, conversation, and I'm actually a homeowner in Denver, and I recently took a job down here at the college. And so I, I guess I was very perplexed to learn that, you know, having lived in the Front Range in Colorado Springs and Denver for over 20 years, uh, I never thought about water and the educational and the conservation efforts seem fairly minimal and I was curious to see in those <coughs> metro roundtables are there developers there to talk about or to discuss why do we always have green lawns in Denver I mean why I mean I just run through my neighborhood and other neighborhoods and everybody has to have a green lawn why do we have to have these green lawns I moved to La Junta and I live here during the week and it's it's all there's no soil it's just dirt every lawn is just dirt because you can't grow anything uh, so I mean we could we could have you know zero escaping efforts and we could have incentives for people that do that and and I drive past City Park and I see them watering at noon and I can't water my lawn at noon so why is City Park doing that so I, I'm just you know how do we get folks you know, homeowners and have a grassroots movement in suburbia, in the front range, and get them to the table as well, get the development, the developers to the table. As you see, most of these people here, I'm sure, are farmers and residents and have a concern because they see it firsthand. We don't see that in the front range. We just turn on the spigot and we hose down our driveway because we want it to look pretty. Uh, you can't do that here. And how, how do we reach that? and educate. So the question was about conservation. If you couldn't hear it in the back, uh, generally a person who has, I'm envious, moved from Denver to the Arkansas uh, Valley here uh, recently and has noticed that there is a, a uh, really a shortfall of, in her opinion, uh, messaging on conservation in the Front Range communities. And, and really, the uh, is there anybody from Denver Water here, actually? <laughs> Because I'd hate to, you know, not give them the opportunity to respond, but the the, uh, <laughs> the reality is that, uh, you know, they, to their credit, all jokes aside, uh, they've spent a hundred million dollars over the last decade to to work on changing the conservation ethos in in Denver. So you see some pretty innovative advertising that goes on in, in by Denver Water, but you still see a lot of green lawns. There's no doubt about it, and we have to, you know, as I. 
I, I was asked that question on uh, Colorado Matters on uh, public radio a couple of weeks ago. And they asked, well, what are you personally, because I live at 6th in Colorado, what are you personally doing to uh, work on conservation in your own home? And you got to do some pretty, you know, they seem like common sense things, but if you just turn on the spigot and you think water's just supposed to come out, you, they, you, don't, you might not think of them. Uh, you got to use seed that is drought tolerant and requires less water. And it's not going to look as, as emerald green. And you, and, you know, that's part of the, the change in the ethos that has to occur. We have to have uh, folks that are OK with a, a little bit of a greenish brown lawn. And that's OK. But it's also true that as you fly into DIA and you look down and you see all those trees, all of them, every single one, unless you're right around the creek and you're looking at a cottonwood, all those trees are non-native. So if you stop irrigating the lawn, you better have a system that gets water to those trees or you're going to lose those trees. And I can tell you, you know, that does not sit well with a lot of people who look at their landscape in Denver and say, well, one of the reasons I moved here is because I need a little shade in the 110 degree heat that I'm, I'm up against here. So um, we, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, the answer is, I, you know, the water plan is going to have to talk about conservation. The governor says every conversation about water should start with conservation. Uh, there's a fixtures bill moving through. Uh, it's moved through the legislature recently. Uh, yeah, to talk about that and you know we we just have to get better and the water plan hopefully will open some eyes that well, right now are closed or uh, just not aware of the issue I got two minutes he says if the specifics from different basin implementation plans are in direct conflict with one another what sort of mechanism do you see for resolving that so if there's conflict between the basin implementation plans, then we're going to uh, immediately scuttle the entire plan. And <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that, Chris? No, <laughs> no what, what we're going to do is, <laughs> no, it's, it's a great question. Everybody's been asking it. We're, first off, we're going to see a lot more consensus in these plans than we see divergence. But where we do see com conflict, uh, we're gonna we're gonna end up seeing uh, you know hopefully the basin implementation plans uh, and the basin roundtables themselves working together uh, to to bridge those pro those those inconsistencies, uh, but also the interbasin compact committee uh, sits at a great place you know two members from each basin roundtable are appointed to this basin interbasin compact committee, they sit at a perfect in a perfect uh, forum to have a discussion about those conflicts. So we're hoping that that is where those uh, take place. And then our board is geographically appoint appointed. So we're hoping that you know, they, can, they can help. Oh, Diane Hoppy's here too from the South Platte. I didn't mention Diane. Uh, so we, we, uh, we have, uh, uh, I think, a process or a structure to get at those points of inconsistency and try and resolve them. But if we don't resolve them, we don't resolve them. I mean, we, we, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to brush over any of that in, in the water plan and act like it's not there. So we're hoping that we can get there, though. Let's give James a, a hand. Thank you.